What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu philosopher, and I'm here to tell you that 95% of karate is absolutely useless. Bullshit. Don't believe me? Look around at most of the karate that you see advertised in your neighborhood, or just do a quick search for karate demonstrations on the Google machine. If you want a good laugh, or perhaps a cathartic cry, McDojo Life channel has dozens upon dozens of videos of questionable or laughable fake martial arts practice whose only real utility is that they might make your attacker collapse from laughter rather than remembering to attack you. But I'm not even talking about clearly fake McDojo techniques. Plenty of 100% legitimate dojos, with verifiable lineages and experience studying under masters, still teach techniques that are completely useless. Bullshit. In the modern day, mixed martial arts competitions like the Ultimate Fighting Championships, Pride FC, Bellator, Ganryujima, and many others have brought a healthy dose of reality back into modern martial arts. Since these competitions pit different styles against each other, fighters can't rely on techniques that only work against a compliant opponent or assume an unrealistic starting scenario. There's a reason why you don't see much Aikido in the UFC, since most Aikido techniques rely on your partner knowing when to take a fall, and almost all Aikido training is completely devoid of pressure testing, meaning that even if their techniques were valid, almost no one who trains it knows how to actually apply them. Karate is, of course, a different matter. There are definitely fighters in MMA who have used karate either as a base art or as a supplement. Famously, Lyoto Machida was a powerful competitor in the UFC and has moved on to a strong showing in Bellator, basing his fighting style largely on Shotokan. Several other fighters, like Bas Rutten and Robert Whittaker, have used their karate in the octagon, and several other successful fighters have supplemented their training with various styles of karate. However, even the best UFC karate fighters often supplement their striking with boxing or Muay Thai, and turn to arts like wrestling or BJJ for grappling. The karate fighters in MMA seem to be the exception, not the rule, and many karate-only competitions seem to model themselves off of the WKF sparring rule set, which leads to severely compromised practicality. However, in the past, karate was a strong and effective martial art, with its practitioners being some of the most dangerous people one could fight. Motobu Choki, one of the most famous karate masters, was known for being a violent street fighter, seeking out brawls and rarely losing, even being reputed to have taken down a formidable foreign boxer at the age of 52. In fact, when it was introduced to Japan, many Japanese people viewed karate as a brutal tradition where the Ryukyuans would beat each other fiercely. So there's little doubt that, in the past, karate techniques were some of the most practical fighting skills around. So why did karate change? While there may not be a single perfect answer, I have a theory. A karate theory. <laughs> oh god, game theory jokes. So join me as I raise the question, what happened to good karate? Let's get into it. I missed the O oh, karate. Recently, a term that's been all the rage in online karate discussion is karate jutsu. While karate do represents the way of the empty hand, the term jutsu, meaning technique, is meant to distinguish the true fighting techniques and applications of karate, a return to the rough, effective days of fighters like Motobu Choki. Karateka and researchers such as Ian Abernethy and Patrick McCarthy have been searching for the true connections between modern karate and its true fighting roots. Their ideas revolve around analyzing the kanta found in historical karate, and analyzing it specifically through the framework of its bunkai, the deconstruction or analysis of the techniques. Since the kata were, according to these researchers, originally two-person practice scenarios that were represented as single-person drills, the techniques in kata ought to provide insight into the original fighting techniques that went into them. Of course, there are a number of dojos which teach kata bunkai today, as well as shorter partner drills known as yakusoku kumite, where the technique and response is prearranged. However, many of these drills rely on assumptions that an attacker will simply leave their punching arm extended, and include techniques that many people criticize as being just for show. Ian Abernethy has some articles on his website, linked in this video's sources, which discuss how to properly interpret kata bunkai, and which propose that many dojos make a mistake by assuming that a technique that's called a block has to be interpreted as a blocking motion. However, even if the true analysis of kata is discovered through technical analysis, stylistic comparison, or historical research, there are still people who would criticize them for being ineffective at teaching fighting. Now these criticisms come down to two main ones, one of which I think is incorrect, and one of which I think is valid. The first is that katas only contain a small number of fighting techniques. I personally think that there is quite a bit more to katas than one might first believe, but also that karateka were expected to practice basic techniques like punching combinations, which are still included in many dojos today. However, the more valid critique is that kata bunkai practice relies on a compliant opponent, 
and therefore isn't pressure testing. In his book Karate Do, My Way of Life, Shotokan pioneer Funakoshi Gichin describes his early training with Azato Yasutsune, his primary teacher, and Itosu Anko. He describes his practice as comprising endless repetition of a single kata, well beyond the bounds of simply memorizing or strengthening the form. In fact, he recounts that he was not permitted to move on to a new kata until he had sufficiently understood the one on which he was working. Funakoshi also recounted many times being made to lick the dust on the floor of the dojo or the azato backyard. It's likely that, during this period of the martial art, understanding of a kata was tested by what Ian Abernethy and Patrick McCarthy would call kata-based sparring, freeform matches where the student was tasked with making use of kata techniques to defeat their teacher. Funakoshi also mentions making use of tegumi, the local Okinawan practice akin to freestyle wrestling, as a method of both training his body and applying karate techniques. Historians can use contemporary accounts like Funakoshi Sensei's to reconstruct what karate practice historically looked like, and based on this account, it seems like karate used to contain quite a bit of sparring and pressure testing. Additionally, I've already mentioned figures like Motobu Choki, who would involve themselves in fights as another source of live sparring practice. It's also important to note that this instruction was given in one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups, with the teacher being present to correct the student at every moment in training. For instance, Accounts of Miyagi Chojun Sensei's training suggest that Higaona Kanryo Sensei spent a lot of time directly overseeing both his weight training and kata practice, and also that Miyagi often received direct chances to practice with Higaona or some of his fellow students like Higa Seiko or Kyoda Juhatsu. These pioneers were no strangers to pressure testing, and many of them even went so far as to seek out practice or matches with other styles of martial arts, such as when Funakoshi Sensei would visit other masters on Azato Sensei's recommendation, or when Miyagi Sensei reached out to Kano Jigoro, the founder of Judo. So how did karate become what it is today, and why do I think it's so ineffective? A lot of karateka blame the decline in karate standards on tournaments or sparring competitions, as well as the general sportification of karate. I'm tempted to agree somewhat, and I do have my qualms about point sparring and how it affects karateka's interpretation of their techniques. However, I would argue that the changes that made karate ineffective come from a much different place. To start with, let's take a look at one of Funakoshi Sensei's teachers, Itosu Anko. In the late 19th century, the Japanese army began to consider karate training to be part of its military preparation program, but ultimately discarded it since proficiency in karate required years, and military training was limited to a few months at most. However, Itosu Sensei believed that the Okinawan martial arts could serve to strengthen the bodies and minds of young citizens, and in 1901, he began introducing karate into the school system for elementary school, high school, and a teacher's college. This led to a significant increase in karate students that had to be taught at the same time, and many of these students were still very young. That's why Itosu Sensei began to modify his karate teaching, simplifying the katas to make them easier to teach, and removing some of the more effective techniques from the versions that he taught to children. With this increase in class sizes, Itosu Sensei and many other masters who taught in police academies or prefectural schools had to alter their pedagogy, the theory and technique of how they taught. Instead of being able to focus on individual students and give hands-on explanations of techniques and application, these senseis were now in charge of larger classes and had to give every student fair attention. Some teachers, like Miyagi Sensei, adopted a rather freeform style where he would allow students to practice and give one-on-one -on -one or small group feedback. But the more students came to learn karate, the more the teaching style had to change to suit the class size. These changes, I believe, are when karate started on a downhill trajectory. Modern pedagogy research suggests that the optimal ratio of students to teachers is somewhere around one teacher for every eight students. However, with the martial arts, the physical nature requires a lot more interaction with a teacher than other topics might. A lot of the key problems with modern karate, such as the reliance on static, awkward stances, prearranged forms with little pressure testing, and even the habit of holding one's punch out and waiting for a response, make sense to me as adaptations to teach larger groups. Let's look at the way kihon techniques, and especially punches, are often taught in modern dojos. While other arts such as boxing tend to have a lead hand and a rear hand, and have their punches quickly retracted after being thrown, many karate dojos will have students stand in a line, in a parallel stance, and alternate punches with no guard while the hand is left extended. If a teacher were working in small groups, they might be able to give critiques on hand shape, wrist and elbow positioning, or other technical matters fairly easily. In fact, boxing coaches regularly do just that. However, if you're in charge of correcting technique for multiple students, it would be easier to have them freeze in position to inspect all of their punches at the same time. 
And while 90% of people are right-handed, the chance of having a southpaw in your class is high enough to where you wouldn't be able to focus on just one side being a lead hand. Guarding also becomes neglected when you practice your technique against the open air, rather than a partner, since it's less crucial if you're not worried about getting struck. In fact, so much of pressure testing goes out the window when you have larger groups of students. A sparring match or drill can take up a lot of floor space, so you either have to stop the entire class to focus on two students, or to restrict your sparring until it becomes a very compliant practice. Additionally, rather than being able to teach the nuances of different kata, it becomes much easier to classify each move in a kata as a certain step, or strike, or block, and smooth out any of the small but meaningful differences in favor of nice, easy-to-teach patterns. However, the nail in the coffin comes when people who've only learned through this limited style of pedagogy go on to teach their own students. Since they don't have the same background of pressure testing as their teachers, it might not even occur to them to include it in their teaching. Many schools nowadays appeal to tradition to justify why they teach in the way that they do, but they fail to recognize whether the traditions that they're following are true traditions or constructed. And even traditions can be flawed. The modern teacher must be willing to adopt new pedagogy, new techniques, and new information if they're looking to teach effective karate. The good news is that karate isn't unsalvageable. Although there are many dojos that teach with these ineffective and outmoded techniques, there are still schools that incorporate more practical methods of pressure testing and teaching. There are a lot of ways that karateka can rediscover the soul of karate and return it to the practical fighting tradition that it used to be. After all, it's not like the base techniques are fantasy-based like some martial arts or mcdojos. Rather, the problem is that the teaching style has accidentally limited karate and forced it to discard most of its strength and applicability in favor of being easy to teach to school children. Some people have taken the MMA approach and cross-trained with other striking arts, such as boxing or Muay Thai, in order to add an element of realism back into their karate practice. Others have taken a critical eye to karate's past, examining the old kata and techniques to uncover their original effectiveness. Both of these paths are valid and necessary ways to improve your karate and make it into the 5% that actually doesn't suck. As Miyagi Chojun sensei once wisely said, we should open karate to the public and receive criticism, opinions, and studies from other prominent fighting artists. But no matter how you choose to rediscover good karate, keep at it, never give up, and always be willing to learn something new. Thanks for watching this video all the way through to the end. It